Today is my dad's birthday. He's 73. He's not here, but in Spartanburg, South Carolina. He said he'd be praying for the session here this morning. And so when I woke up this morning, my priority today was to text pop. And then on the way to school, taking the kids to call pop, let the kids say, happy birthday to grandpa. And the reason it relates to priority is that fathers in particular teach their children priorities. So many said things, so many unsaid things. One of the priorities I saw in my dad as a kid, as a teenager, he's not a pastor. He was a dentist for 43 years and is now retired. I would come down in the morning from my bedroom, morning after morning after morning, and the light was already on in Pop's study. And he was reading the Bible before he went into the dental office. And he made clear in the life of our family that the church was a priority. We were there every Sunday without negotiation. And we were there on Sunday nights. And we were there on Wednesday nights. How many churches still do Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night? He taught us the priority of the church. Now that, that word priority, refers to precedence in time or in rank. A priority is the thing regarded as more important than another or than others. Interestingly, if you uh, use the Google Books Ingram, where you can search how often words have appeared, I think it goes back to 1800. Now it's, it's not exact. The results aren't necessarily reliable, but it can be interesting to see the usage of the words as they've been able to track them with their searches of books that they have on Google Books. And this word priority is interesting. From 1800 until 1938 or so, the word just kind of slowly moves along, slowly growing, slowly growing. You get to 1938, World War II. The use of priority goes up. And then there's a, there's a post-war lull in the use of this word priority. And then there is a great incline along about the mid 60s through the 70s. Then you have the heyday of priority in the 80s and the 90s. This big bubble of use of the word priority. And then around late 90s, 99, 2000, this drastic fall in the use of the word priority in terms of the Google index. And I can't help but wonder, though the results aren't reliable, whether our ability to prioritize well and the energy and the attention that we give to prioritizing well may have had some kind of decline along with the use of the word. And priority is a tricky concept. To, priority one, to prioritize one entity over another, it means something, but it doesn't say yet what it means. It's relative to, to the relationships. It's one thing to prioritize your yard, prioritize the game, prioritize your wife. And in this session, we're talking about the priority of the church. And however theological we get with our ecclesiology, with our doctrine of the church, we're talking about priorities of the church, this inevitably relates to our priorities. This was an uncomfortable session to prepare for. This might be an uncomfortable session to sit through. Ecclesiology already has that practical leaning. And to talk about the priority of the church is going to relate to our priorities. Now, it'd be one thing to talk about priorities if we had just a gathering of Christians in general, but it's the pastor's conference. So you could speak about the priority of the church 
in a local church gathering or even a gathering of Christian lawyers. You could talk about the priority of the church to lawyers. You could talk about the priority of the church to a gathering of Christian athletes. But brothers, there is even all the more connection for those of us who do this work vocationally. So this is a message for lead officers in the church and those who aspire to the lead office, variously called pastor, elder, overseer, one title for one lead office in the church. And the applications here are significant for those of us who have our breadwinning vocation in the church. There is no vocational disconnect from the priority of the church and our vocational labors for those of us who are pastors. So let me pray for our moments together, and then we'll look together at Ephesians 3.10. So Father in heaven, in a room like this with so many needs, many who are weary and indeed need encouragement, many who are coasting and need fresh awakening, Many who have coasted and become dull and need to reprioritize. Father, you know how to meet these needs through your word, by your spirit. Would you draw near in these moments? Help us to see the glory of your vision, your priorities in Ephesians chapter 3. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Ephesians 3.10 is given as our focus, and it's not a complete sentence on its own. Let me read 310 and then bring in some context. Thankfully, Lewis has already read the chapter for us. We'll go back in there and we'll come back to Ephesians 310. This will mainly be a meditation on Ephesians 310 from the angle of priority. Ephesians 310. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Lewis walked us so well through chapter two, and the one new man formed out of the two. And in chapter three, verse one, Paul starts moving toward a prayer. So he writes this, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, and he breaks off, and he gives us this glorious aside in verses 2 to 13. It's not an accident. He means for this to be an aside. It wasn't like he was just dictating this letter once and the secretary grabbed it down and they never reviewed it, never edited it, never polished it. No, he wants this aside. He wants to start the prayer in verse 1 and come back and pray it in verse 14. And in the meantime, give us this glorious aside. So he says in verse 2, he wants us to know about his special calling. And he's going to talk about the church's special calling. Paul's is the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, he says in verse 2. And you hear the church already in for you. And he speaks about the mystery of Christ, which is not an unsolved mystery, but one that has now been made known. So what is this mystery? Once unsolved, now made known. Look at verse 6. Now we'll go verses 6 to 10. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power to me. Though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I I would love to linger over unsearchable riches. It's not where we're going in the session. Come back to that at some other point. 
preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And now verse 10, our focus. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I take it that our focus in this session is supposed to be on the church as the object of our prioritizing. You might have wondered the priority of the church. Does that mean what the church's priority is or what others' priority is related to the church? I think it's supposed to be about what is the priority of the church for Christians, and in particular for pastors. What's the priority of the church for us in the lead office of the church? That's where we're headed. The church prioritized in the hearts and habits of her members and her ministers. But might we first get our bearings and spend our best energies on a far more important prioritizer? Ephesians 3 is not concerned with our prioritizing. Not yet. Rather, here we marvel at God's prioritizing of the church. And not just God is one, but God is three. So before we get to us, before we get to Christians, before we get to pastors, let's look at the priority of the church for God the Father, for God the Son, and for God the Spirit, and hopefully, in going along this path, path here, this will be an exercise in proper prioritizing. So celebrate with me these four truths from Ephesians 3 about the priority of the church with our hearts and habits coming last. Number one, the Father prioritizes the church in His plan and His purpose. The Father, Father, prioritizes and demonstrates for Son priority. The Father prioritizes the church in His plan and purpose. Verse 9 mentions the plan. Verse 11, His eternal purpose. So pick it up again at verse 9. Paul's calling is to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. And then our focus in verse 10, skip ahead to verse 11 now. This was according to the eternal purpose that the Father has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So verse 11 mentions the eternal purpose. Verse 9, the plan of the mystery hidden for ages, now revealed in God who made all things. And that's the same language Paul already used in Ephesians chapter 1. We heard this as Lewis read through Ephesians chapter 1. Plan and purpose are right there together in verses 10 and 11 of Ephesians 1. In the gospel, Paul says, God has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose, there's purpose, of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. So God the Father has an eternal purpose before creation, and He has a plan that He works out in creation, in the fullness of time, in history. Lord of creation, Lord of history. And what is this eternal purpose and plan? Now we need chapter 3, verse 10. Paul says he preaches to bring to light God's plan that through the church the wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So three parts here to verse 10. I think to understand verse 10 as we should, 
we need to look at these three parts. Let's, let's work backwards through verse 10. So first, the rulers and authorities. Who are they? Then, what's this manifold wisdom of God? And then third, how does it relate to the church? This is all under the Father's prioritizing the church in His plan and purpose. So first, who are these rulers and authorities? It's Ephesians, right? So hopefully 612 comes to mind. This is a helpful verse to remember in a time when algorithms condition us for digital culture war. 612, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So now we have in the heavenly places in 612, which we also have in 310, So the rulers and authorities are minimally, perhaps mainly, spiritual forces of evil, the devil and his demons, the cosmic powers over this present darkness. They're not earthly creatures, but heavenly ones in the upper register or in another dimension, however it is or how you'd put it. And we might assume that the good angels are looking on to. Peter says of the good news of Jesus, of his sufferings, his subsequent glory, his grace, his salvation, that angels long to look in these things. I think we can assume the good angels are looking on too. So Ephesians 6.10 expands the audience that Paul's been talking about and the audience that we're prone to think of. Previously, Paul has talked about potentially speaking the gospel to everyone on earth. He preaches to everyone, he says, if you can only get to them. But now he says, presently, in view, are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Not only potentially, but presently watching this reality of the church. Second then. What's the manifold wisdom of God? God's wisdom is what lies behind and is revealed alongside the mystery long hidden, now revealed in Jesus. Remember how we saw that in verse 6? This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. God's wisdom becomes evident in the great unveiling that is the preaching of Christ. And God's wisdom here, I love this, God's wisdom here is said to be manifold, many-sided, varied, complex, in a good way, is good complexity. The gospel may be a simple message. And yet the divine wisdom it reveals is no simple, basic, one-dimensional wisdom. It's not a single insight or mark of wisdom, but many. The gospel of Christ overturns and surpasses and puts to shame the wisdom of man. And it does so not just once, over and over and over again that God would become man and confound the world's wisdom and have an ignoble birth and a childhood in obscurity, in a backwater, and live unknown to the public essentially for three decades and be despised and rejected by his own people at the height of his influence and be crucified as a slave by the Romans. And then after rising from the dead, would ascend and be enthroned in heaven, not Rome, and pour out his spirit, and not only bring back his people, the Jews, but go far and wide to bring in Gentiles from every tribe and every tongue and every nation in this new covenant reality called the church. That is stunning, multifaceted, many-sided wisdom. 
over and over again doing what humans do not expect. In the simple gospel of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God is on display overturning our wisdom, our strengths, our nobility. Christ crucified is a stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And that phrase, both Jews and Greeks, in one body, one man from the two, that's at the heart of what makes this wisdom so stunning and horrifying to the demons, horrifying to the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There was a time, Paul says, times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands people everywhere to repent, and the demons see it, and they shudder, which leads us to the last phrase then in verse 10 through the church. How does it relate to the church? Demons looking on with good angels too, God's many splendored wisdom. And my prayer here for us as pastors is that God might be pleased to lift our eyes from the ordinariness and the smallness and the annoyances and the frustrations of everyday practical church life that we might see the church a little bit more like our God sees the church. In the immeasurable riches of his divine Trinitarian fullness, infinitely happy, overflowing with joy and creative energy and redeeming grace, our God in the gospel of his son is making known his many splendored wisdom to the spiritual forces of evil. And how does he do it? Verse 10 says, does it through the church, not armies, not technology, not sports heroes, not influential entertainers, not political maneuvering, but through the church. The manifold wisdom of God is now being made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. The church is the chosen instrument for showing the cosmic powers, good and evil, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how unscrutable are his ways. The reality and existence of the church, this seemingly unimpressive, lowly, ignoble, unwise, unwealthy, unaccomplished body in local manifestations, covenanted to each other, this ragtag church, this otherwise unremarkable church shows Satan and his minions that their time is short. In effect, God says, you see the church? Gentiles are believing. The gospel is spreading. Checkmate. How does that work? How does it work that the manifold wisdom through the church to the demonic powers? Rehearse the gospel again now with all three, all of all these three in view from Ephesians 3.10. The Son of God takes human flesh and lives a lowly life in obscurity for 30 years. And just when he really begins to turn heads, Jews and Gentiles conspire to cut him down and put an end, and seemingly end the story. The crucifixion looks like utter folly not manifold wisdom. The whole thing looks like folly at this point. Then he rises again. Then there's more surprise, because 40 days later he ascends, and he's in heaven, and he's gone. Now what? 
From heaven's throne, the risen Christ pours out his spirit. And his gospel spreads through faith and repentance. And the church begins to grow and increase and multiply and spread, not only among Jews, but also Gentiles, Gentiles. I'm just such a Gentile, I don't think about it. I think we're really supposed to be shocked that the Gentiles have been brought near like this. You remember in Pisidian Antioch, Paul comes in to preach the gospel to the Jews. They reject his message, and he says, because you have rejected the message, we are turning to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, like you, like me, are overhearing this from the outside, like the angels longing to look on this. We're overhearing it from the outside. And he says, we are turning to the Gentiles with this message. And when the Gentiles heard it, they began rejoicing, brought to the inside of the people of God. This is an amazing reality that he includes us Gentiles. And so the church spreads from city to city and nation to nation, and the seeming folly of incarnation and cross and ascension is shown visibly to be manifold wisdom, many-sided wisdom. Not all the earth yet sees it. All the heavens see it. And as his gospel advances and the church grows, the Gentiles stream into the church and the manifold wisdom of God grows ever brighter. The church, normal, local, ragtag, seemingly unimpressive, including Gentiles, burst now with spectacular cosmic significance that demonstrates the manifold wisdom of God and shows the evil powers the surety of their doom. He is making known his manifold wisdom, not just in the physical realm, but the spiritual, for all the universe to see. And how does he do it? He does it through the church. Brothers, the main thing happening in the world right now, and at all times, is that Jesus is building his church, that Jesus is caring for his church. What he is doing in and through his church is the main thing, not what CNN says or New York Times, or Fox, reporting their sham news about what's really going on. And brothers, you're pastors. Is this still your priority? One quote here from Jonathan Edwards. I thought Mike was gonna quote it last night because he was so all over it, dancing around it. This is not from miscellany. This is late in Edward's ministry. This is in a sermon. And the priority of the father of the church brings to mind this memorable quote that helps us transition to the son's priority. Edward says, the creation of the world seems to have been especially for this end, that the eternal son of God might obtain a spouse toward whom he might fully exercise the infinite benevolence of his nature and to whom he might, as it were, open and pour forth all the, that immense fountain of condescension, love, and grace that was in his heart, and that in that way, God might be glorified. So let's say more about the Son. Number two, the Son prioritizes the church in his purpose and presiding. The Son prioritizes the church in his purpose and presiding. Enthroned in heaven, Christ now presides over the universe, as we heard last night. He reigns over all. He reigns over the nations and the angelic realms with sovereign power, all authority in heaven and earth given to him. And as he presides, he prioritizes his church. We can turn to John 17. The priority of the church there is striking and beautiful. 
But let's stay here in Ephesians and do Ephesians 5, 23 to 30. Chapter 5 makes a connection between human marriage and Christ and the church. Paul's mystery language now relates to marriage. What was hidden for ages and now revealed is that all along, from the garden until now, human marriage has been patterned on the son's love for his bride. And in our considering how the son prioritizes his church, we have here both a decisive act at the cross in the past, and we have his present attention to the church as he reigns in heaven, presiding for the good of his church. Here's the past, verse 25, referring to the cross. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus, to say the least, prioritized the church in his sacrificial death. He did not simply love humanity in general and so go to the cross to make salvation possible for any who decide to pick it up later on. Rather, he loved the church, Paul says. He gave himself up for her. He had his bride in view, his people, his flock, his church. It was a particular redemption. It had a specific purpose. It was a definite atonement. Sufficient as his cross is for the sins of all, it is effective for his church. You call that priority, at least. So as Paul says in Acts 20, 28, the son obtained the church with his own blood. But that's not all. Not just the obtaining in the past, but the present dimensions of Christ prioritizing his church, following the lead of his father. Verses 26 and 27, Jesus died that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And in verses 29 and 30, more present prioritizing, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. So the son bought the church with his own blood and the son rules the universe to sanctify her, cleanse her, wash her, prepare her for himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or smudge or smear. From heaven's throne, he nourishes and cherishes the church as his own body. He builds her, protects her, upholds her. He pays her special attention in her progress, her health, her joy. And the old confessions called this his most special manner. That's the language of Westminster in 1689. This is section 5.7. As the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner it taketh care of his church, and disposeth of all things to the good thereof." Which we heard so clearly last night from Michael. But as we also heard last night. There is more we can say from Ephesians about the priority of the church in the son's eyes. I was sitting here last night with too many pages back at home thinking, what can I cut from this message to fit the time? And Michael said, open to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And I said, well, that's it. <laughs> he covered it so well. So let me just celebrate what he celebrated at greater length. The church is the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church, as his body, not only receives his care, as his body, the church also acts for him and from him. The head acts through his body. The body extends the will and the heart and the grace and the designs of the head out into the world. 
And so Christ fulfills Adam's mandate to fill the earth as the church grows, as the church increases, as the church multiplies, as his fullness, the church, fills all in all. What priority, what privilege, what an unimaginably elevated role for the church, not only as his beneficiaries, but his agents, his actors, his arms, his legs, his hands, his feet. So what is he doing in the world today? He's building his church, purifying his church, nourishing his church, cherishing his church, prioritizing, at least, his church. Yes, he rules over wars. He rules over natural disasters, over human sin, over Satan, over rulers and authorities, and in it all, and through it all, his priority is building his church, and through his church, extending the fullness of his reign in every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So we've observed Christ's most special manner. Now one more here before we talk about us. What about the Spirit? The Spirit prioritizes the church in His power. Talk as we might about how the Spirit is active in the world outside the church, upholding the natural order, extending God's common kindness, inspiring and assisting works of justice or mercy, even industry, art, literature. When we look at what the Spirit does in Ephesians, and the New Testament, it's fair to say, at minimum, he prioritizes the church. Priority language begins to feel grossly inadequate with this most special manner. So just in Ephesians, here's what the Spirit does in prioritizing the church in Ephesians. Those who believe the gospel, he seals for the day of redemption. He is given to us as the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of God. He gives us access to the Father. In Him, we are being built together into a dwelling place for God. By Him, the gospel has been revealed to the prophets and apostles. The Spirit strengthens us with the power of God. He is the power at work in us. He unifies the church. He fills us leading us to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in our heart, and to give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And it is the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God and our offensive weapon, and even helps us pray in 618. And when Paul finishes his glorious aside in chapter 3, verses 2 to 13, and he begins his prayer in verse 14, he prays in essence for the work of the Spirit in us. Just to round out chapter 3, this prayer in verses 14 to 19 about the Spirit's work in the church comes with the confidence that he will indeed answer this prayer. He loves to do this. This is not a long shot. And so Paul spills over into doxology, celebrating the ability of God to do far more abundantly than we can ask or even think. And then, amazingly, the priority of the church emerges again, strikingly. Verses 20 and 21. Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work in us, spirit, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That is amazing placement of the church. To him be glory. And I expect in Christ Jesus... I don't know that I expect him to say, in the church. And yet, because of his grace and mercy and the work of of his son, he has elevated the church to this channel through which he displays his glory alongside his son. So how is God being glorified in the world today 
at this time, stand in awe in the church and in Christ Jesus. Through Christ, seated in heaven, and through his church, displaying him in the world, in every major city, advancing on every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So the Spirit seals, he builds, he reveals, he strengthens, he fills. The bride of Christ is his priority, at least. However much he works unsavingly outside the church, his work is decidedly, emphatically, pronouncedly asymmetrical. He prioritizes the church. Finally then, what about the priority of the church in our lives? This is a quick transition to practical. Well, how about the priority of the church in our life? First, how might we as Christians, so this is for us and for our people, how might we as Christians prioritize the church in our hearts and in our habits, internal, worked out externally? Number one, so this, is, this would be under number four, we prioritize the church in our hearts and habits. Number one, we adopt the priorities of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and resolve to rehearse the glories that our world conditions us to forget. Christ has triumphed and sat down at the right hand. Our head rules the universe and does so amazingly for and through the church. Don't be snookered by the unbelieving world that says that what matters most is politics and sports or whatever else seems so electric in the moment. There is no more important gathering in the world than the church. Our silly, seemingly silly looking membership meeting of 150 on Sunday afternoon was more important than what happened at the Raven Stadium. Number two, we prioritize the church over all other groups and associations in our lives, Christian or otherwise. So institutions, workplaces, neighborhoods, teams, even ministries, in time, they will all perish. God will roll them up like a garment, but not his church. The church will remain. She will go through the final fire. She will endure. In time, the gates of Hades will prevail over all other societies, but not against the church. Number three, we prioritize the church in the good that we seek to do in the world. Among other good things we might seek to do in our cities and in our towns, most important is our involvement in the body of Christ in which eternal human souls find rescue from eternal suffering and physical help besides. As pastors, we help our people realize, whatever their vocation, that the single most important involvement in their lives for the good of others, among other noble causes, is engaging with and investing in the local church. Doesn't mean we don't do other things, but we prioritize. Number four, we prioritize the church in our affection for individual believers. We want to learn to love with the eyes of Jesus. You know what that means? Not many of you were strong. Not many of you were of noble birth. Not many of you were wise by our worldly standards. That means we learn to love the weak, the ignoble, the foolish, the annoying, the frustrating, to whom we are joined in Christ as his church. Number five, we take care to leverage what a resource we have in the church. Beware the outsourcing impulse too quickly. A lot of talk these days about outsourcing. 
I know there's some wisdom in it, depending on the situation. Don't undersell what a resource we have in the church for counseling, for advice, for arbitration of disputes among Christians. We got a text on this. When one of you has a grievance against one another, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try, tri to try trivial cases? Do you not know we will judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Number six, we prioritize the church through covenant membership. Committing to a particular local church and actively fulfilling our covenant is the first concrete way that the priority of the church takes root in our lives. We voice such a priority implicitly in our church covenants as we make promises to each other to be the church for each other, not just in the good times, the easy times, but the hard times. It's easy in the easy times, right? It's hard in the hard times. The priority of the church in our hearts finds expression in covenant membership in a particular local church. Christians will not adequately prioritize the church without committing to the fellowship and being held accountable. So what about us pastors then? We finish with this. I had six for Christians in general. Let me finish with six brief, with seven brief ones for us particularly as pastors and those who aspire to be pastors, and the few I see in the room, perhaps married to pastors. Number one, brothers, marvel at this calling. Brother pastors, without minimizing the righteous vocations of non-pastors in our congregation, can you believe what we get to do? Pastoral work is get to work. This is not have to work. You don't have to do this. You can get out of it. If you've been stuck on have to for too long, you can get out. Apparently Paul couldn't get out. It was have to for him. You can get out. I know there's hard days and there's hard seasons, there's stresses and there's strains where the get to work doesn't feel like it, it feels like have to work for a little bit. But brothers, in light of the Godhead's priority of the church, is there any greater privilege, any greater blessing in vocational life than getting to work on the one institution that has the special attention of God and over which the gates of hell will not prevail? Everything else your people work on will be wiped out eventually, not the church. If the rough and tumble of ministry has caused your vision of the church and its priority to feel small and dull and boring, ask God to raise your head. Linger in Ephesians 3.10 and Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and ask God to put church back on the map of your heart where it should be. Number two, seek to win your people to prioritize the church in their schedules. Some of our people want family-friendly churches to cater to their family idolatry. What if we cast a vision for church-friendly families? Instead of presuming the church should adjust to dozens or hundreds of families, what if godly dads and moms adjusted their family rhythms to prioritize the church? What if we built our families around the few but important weekly flashpoints of church life? 
The church is the big rocks to put in the jar at the beginning of the week with the schedule. The other stuff are the little pebbles to add in afterwards. Number three, hold your people accountable to their membership covenant. The pastor set the tone for how seriously the congregation takes membership. You can have all the apparatus in place and nothing happens of much spiritual good if the pastors aren't giving energy to it, holding people accountable for it in firm and gracious ways. If the pastors aren't diligent to oversee the flock and give regular upkeep to the roster and pursue drifting members, our people will treat their membership as a small, empty reality, and they will not prioritize the church. Number four, in light of the priority of the church in the Godhead, we pastors might resist the temptation to ask less and less of our people. When overly busy congregants complain that the church is doing too much, or offering too much, or gathering too often, or gathering for too long, we might say, patiently, graciously, we might resist the impulse. We might say, I don't think we're going to keep cutting, and shortening, and abbreviating, and rushing. This is a priority in our Christian lives. Overwork demands, over hobbies, over personal and family conveniences and comforts. We're not going to apologize for opening the church doors. We're not going to apologize for gathering God's people for worship, for teaching, for prayer, for meals together. Church is priority enough to come early and stay late. Number five. In our own lives, exercise wisdom with news, social media, hobbies, and entertainment, including ESPN. Brothers, if you take out your phone and go to settings, and then go to something like screen, it's going to be called screen time or something like that, yeah, screen time, you can see how many minutes a day you spend on ESPN, or X, or YouTube, YouTube TV, Netflix. Do you know what you're doing or what you're not doing when you're in the digital world? Probably. Here's just a sampling of things you're probably not doing when you're in the digital world. Communing with the risen Christ. Husbanding. Fathering. Pastoring a flock of eternal souls for whom you will give an account. That doesn't mean there's no space or rhythms of life for rest and pastimes, maybe even news. It used to be a virtue to be in the know Sometimes our people need to hear us say, hey, pastor, did you see, did you see, did you see? No, I haven't haven't seen that yet. And you know what? I've been super happy in Jesus, and I didn't know about that. (laughs) Brothers, that is a precious list of things you're not doing to let slide. Would you fancy yourself a man of Issachar who understands the times and knows what to do? Perhaps you should seriously consider an audit of your social media and your news consumption. No wise, healthy pastor can go with the world's flow and saunter through the digital world without vigilance. Number six, if your priorities have drifted over the years, through coasting, through incrementally getting more interested in other things, or through the disorientation of pandemic in recent years, 
Brothers, return to your former love. Return to your former priorities. Perhaps as the years have passed, with the, conflict, with the complex influences and pressures, you have become engaged in civilian pursuits. It's Paul's language in 2 Timothy 2.4. What started as being where your people are to provide spiritual leadership for them has slowly become over time entanglement in secular affairs and undue distraction from your calling. And I pray this conference would be an opportunity to freshly see the glory of your work and make some mid-course corrections. Seventh and finally, this leads into tonight, enjoy being a man of the book. And, and here I'm talking to you not only as Christians, that's implicit in the first point of the ones for Christians, I'm talking as a pastor. This is another get to point. This is not another have to. At least that's not, not where the accent should be. When we start our day in the book and linger over God's word without hurry and steep our souls in what he has to tell us about the glory of his son and his gospel and the high vision of the church, we're so quick to forget in our secular society. If you set your mind on the things above, morning after morning, good moments, good attention, not rushing through, not distraction, full engagement, full enjoyment, you will become and remain the kind of man who prioritizes the church and whose instincts and heartbeat prioritizes the church. You, weren't, you won't first and foremost think of human solutions to the deepest and most intractable problems in our world. You will think of conversion and the church. And we get to hear more about the church leaders tonight, which I'm excited for. Pray with me. Father in heaven, what great priority, and so much more than that, in your plan and purpose. Your plan in history, your purpose before the foundation of the world, the priority of your son's purchase, of his prayers in John 17, of his presiding in his reign, the priority of your spirit, and Father, would you work it more deeply in our lives, in our context. Would you preserve proper prioritizing of our local churches and of the reality of church on the ground in tangible ways in our lives? And would you reclaim coasting and drifting and backsliding in our priorities? And would you help us, Father, to be winsome, not demanding, not coercive, winsome commenders of proper prioritizing of the church in our congregations? May our people be one through the joy of their pastors in the good of the church. And would you help those in all different walks here, struggling in many different ways, needing your humbling in different ways, needing your upholding and lifting up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.